Good morning, everyone. Um, so we've got uh, today's class just to continue on with liquid-liquid extraction. And uh, yesterday we ended off by looking at some of the phase diagrams that we're going to use. And we also looked yesterday at the set of equations that go behind one of these systems. So we started with uh, a single stage. Uh, we saw, just recall that we've got our solvent coming in, our feed coming in. And leaving, we have two streams, one we called extract and one we called raffinate. And we derived the equations and the symbols for that system, the last class. And what we did essentially near the end is we showed that there's some un unknown equations. There's actually there's two equations which we don't have. Once we write out all these symbols, we had 15 variables. We derived 13 equations that were linearly independent of each other. There's two more equations that uh, are necessary to solve that system. And in fact, those two equations won't be equations that you could write out on paper. We're going to see in today's class that those two equations or pieces of information we need actually come from this phase diagram. So the use of this diagram is going to be something that uh, is critical to us. And uh, that YouTube video, the link is posted there if you want to watch it again just to refresh your mind on how that diagram works. So what we um, then ended off with the last class as well by the end is we looked at the lever rule, which is a rule that tells us how we can figure out what happens in a system when we take two mixtures, uh, sorry, two, two, uh, yeah, two mixtures, P and Q, and if I combine them and create a single mixture, K is that single mixture. It has that composition shown there on that ternary diagram. And the lever rule tells us how we can find point K. So the simplest uh, under, way to understand this is if you take a mixture of P and a mixture of composition Q, you combine them, you know that it's going to be on the straight line that connects P and Q. How far along that straight line is given by the lever rule that we looked at uh, yesterday. So, so that's... Um, that's a recap essentially of that part. And what's actually important is that the lever rule works in reverse as well. Right? If you find a mixture K, you know that it's going to settle into two phases. And what those phases are are going to be the points on this equilibrium curve, that arc shape. And so if I took a mixture K of that composition and I allow it to come to equilibrium and separate into the two phases, I'm going to have one phase with composition P and another phase with composition Q. And in the same way that I did the lever rule forward, in backwards it also works. If I want to know how much of species, uh, how much of phase P I have and how much of material I have in that uh, phase with composition Q, I can use the lever rule in reverse. Okay? So it works in both directions. And the other critical thing that is interesting is that, in fact, the lever rule works no matter where you are in the diagram. One way to see that is if that's my diagram and my equilibrium curve, my arc is over there. If I took a mixture over there, P, and a mixture over here, Q, I know that the equilibrium, sorry, the mixture is going to be at some point K. If that point K happens to be there, what, is the, what can we tell about mixture K? Yeah. Single phase. It's a single phase, okay? And if you shake it up and allow it to come to equilibrium, something messy is going to happen. In fact, you're going to get, uh, sorry, if you shake it up and allow it to come to equilibrium, it's going to stay at K in this particular case, okay? Because it's in the single phase region. If I mixed P and Q in such a way that the ratio of P and Q that I used allowed it to come to equilibrium at point K2. So that's my mixture. What's going to happen now at K2 when I let it settle again? So we know if I take P and Q and I mix it, it will come to K2. But if I let K2 settle, what's going to happen then? No guesses. This one we need more information, right? If you let a mixture of K2 settle, 
you need to know what the tie lines are. So if the tie lines ran, for example, in this way, K2 will settle along those tie lines. Let me just illustrate that for you. So we saw in the video yesterday, if you allow a mixture at that point to settle, it will settle into two phases along this tie line. And if you don't have a tie line at the point, you interpolate. So it will settle into two, two mixtures over there. Okay. Everyone clear on, on, on that? Does it need another explanation, it seems? Yeah. Okay, we're going to have plenty of practice with this today, so you'll, you'll get another chance. So the key, the key outcome from this is any mixture that's inside this envelope here, when it settles, will settle and split along those tie lines. So let's, um, this, these questions, in fact, are very straightforward. Question two um, is we've just covered. It says that if you mix a species F and S together, it will land up on the point M, depending on how much you mix. Here, if you allow M to come to equilibrium, so if you mix this point, let it come to equilibrium, it will go across those tie lines. Well, those tie lines, if you don't have one there, you can interpolate it, and it will come to rest as R and E, the raffinate and the extract. Okay, so that's, that's a fairly straightforward application of that. So what I'm going to do is let's just go right into an example of this. I'm going to have you work with this. Let's just uh, set up the, the case study for you, and then I'll hand out these uh, sheets, and you can practice on it. So what we have here is we've got a feed F, 250 kilograms. Now you can correct your notes a little bit and look at it as continuous rather than batch. So assume that it's 250 kilograms per hour or 250 kilograms if you want to see it as in batch mode. Continuous mode, 250 kilograms per hour. The solvent you're feeding in at 100 kilograms per hour. And we've given the compositions of the feed and the solvent. We see that, in particular, the solvent, we're told that XSS is 1. So we know that that's pure solvent. And the feed, we're told, has the solute A is 24% by mass. And we're told that the carrier is the rest of it. So there's no solvent in the feed. Okay. So while I'm handing out the sheets, you can confirm that point F on that diagram is where it is, that it's drawn in the correct place. And then I'd like you to figure out where's M, the mixture, and what the composition of the mixture is. So the, the sheets have two sides to it. Both sides are the same. One is for you to make mistakes on, and the other side is to, to keep going with a corrected version. It's also a PDF on the course website if you want to practice later on at home. if you want some extras, yeah. Anyone want a spare copy? There's duplicates, there's lots available. Just pass them around. Any spares? Anyone want some more? Yeah.
found the mixture. Right, let's get there. Need a ruler? That's what I was looking for. You can actually do this one without it, using the equations from yesterday. I'll give you a small hint. Uh, these three values, x, the mass fractions at the mixture, you actually don't need the lever rule. So if you didn't bring your ruler to class today, you can actually get that point without the lever rule. But if you use the lever rule, it's also you should get the same answers. Okay, so let's uh, let's get uh, some answers going here. X, uh, sorry, M. The easiest one, the mass at the mixture, is the sum of them. So we saw that equation yesterday that M equals S plus F. So S plus F in this case gets you 350 kilograms per hour, or 350 kilograms if you're just seeing it as a batch. Did anyone get a chance to use the lever rule for, for M? To find point M? Not yet. Okay, so um, let's take a look at, at point M. Point M you should have located somewhere around that, that position. Okay, so we know that it's there because we're feeding pure solvent. Our solvent is 100% solvent, so that locates point S over there. Okay, now be careful, it's not always over there. If the solvent coming in has got some impurities, then S is not always going to be right in the corner. Um, but in this case, it's pure solvent, and our feed is 24% of A. So if we're counting A up from the bottom, 0, 10, 24% of A, and 76% of carrier C, so you're counting diagonally from this side, so there's 76% of F. And that locates point F over there, which was given to you, in fact. Um, so we know that the mixture must lie on the line that connects S to F. And how far along that line? Well, there's two ways. The easiest way 
is in fact the, the way without using the lever rule. I'll show you the lever rule though, but um, the simplest way is to just do a solute balance. Uh, we saw this equation as one of the equations we put up yesterday where we say F times XFA, remember this is a solute balance, so we're just balancing species A in the feed, plus S times XSA. Well, there is no A coming in in the solute. That term is zero, okay, is equal to the mixture times the mixture of A, the mass fraction of A in the mixture. So this second term is zero. That simplifies this equation quite nicely. We can solve for XMA is equal to F over M. So F, our feed flow rate, is 250 kilograms. Our mixture mass is 350. And so it's that ratio times XFA, which is 0.24. Okay, and then XMA is equal to 0.17 which is that value over here. Okay, so if you've drawn a straight line then that connects S to F, essentially it says that where do you put point M? You put point M at 17%. So 17% is, well, here's zero, there's 10, 20, so it's somewhere in this region here and that's, that's close to 17% in A in the A direction. Okay. You could also, if you didn't do, do it that way you, and you wanted to calculate XMC, you could also do a, a sole uh, carrier balance okay. and calculate XMC as 0.54. Um, you can also do a, solute bal a solvent balance, I should say. So you could do three quick mass balances or do two of the three and calculate the third one um, as a difference. So the solvent balance is 1 minus Okay, so there's any number of ways that you can find that mixture composition. The easiest way is just to find the line, calculate one of these and then locate the point at that. Once you have that point you've got the other two compositions. Right? That's the idea with this ternary diagram is that every point inside that diagram gives you the composition of all three species. Okay. Now if you did want to use the lever rule, uh, the lever rule, I'll just uh, write up the calculation here for you and you can go uh, try it at home if you don't have a ruler with you today. Um, so the lever rule would have said something along the lines of uh, the length of F to M. Just going to take this away. The length of F to M over the length of FS is equal to the mass of which two masses are those the ratios of on the right hand side? Take a minute and everyone know? Everyone clear? Yes? No? I know the people up here are clear, but people at the back? Yes? No? Okay. Mass of S, it's always the third species, F, M, and then the final letter S. In the denominator, we've got F and S already, so then this must be mass of M. Okay. So length F, M is the length that we're interested in because we want to know where M goes. Length of FS you can measure with your ruler. Um, mass of S and mass of M you know. So if you sub in those values, um, at least when I was doing it on my copy, I got this as the ratio of, um, obviously the masses are 100. For the solvent, the mass of M was 350. And then the length of FS uh, was 160 millimeters. Okay, so that length FM then I found to be 
millimeters. So in my copy, I just measure then from F, you measure 45 millimeters along the line, 46 millimeters along the line, and you find M. Okay. So that's an alternative way to get the same answer. Okay, everyone clear on, on that mixture calculation? Okay, let's, uh, let's move on from there. Now we're going to let this come to equilibrium. Mixture M goes to equilibrium. And the question that I want to find out, find these eight unknowns. What is R1? What is E1? So R1 is the raffinates. E1 is the extract mass. So what are these masses here? So we're putting subscript ones onto them because you're going to see we're going to start going to multiple stages in the next class. So this is the first of, of the several stages. So E1 and R1, what are those flow rates? And what are the composition of those flow rates? The one that we're most interested in is the extract of A and the raffinate of A. Those two values, those mass fractions, tell us how much of A we recovered over here in the extract and how much A we lost in the raffinate. So go ahead and calculate those eight values quick. The lever rule tells you, it's the, it basically tells you the ratio of these two lengths is in, inversely proportional to their masses. No, that, that is what you calculate because you want to know where M is. You know where F is, you know where S is, right? So you need to know, you want to figure out where M is. Right. Yeah. You could have also done length SM and then figured it out that way, yeah. Or you could have done the ratio of length SM to the length MF, right? There's three, three possibilities there. OK, everyone got a, a rough way or a rough idea of how to calculate E1 and R1 yet? Which approach are you following? Got an idea here? No, I'm just trying to figure out your so. OK. Got an idea yet? Nice. Do you have the values of E1? How are you going to get them? I don't know. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a look. At once mixture M comes to equilibrium and settles into raffinate and extract, we have um, a construction on your diagram that would look something as follows, where you allow it to come to equilibrium, interpolating between the two tie lines um, since mixture M doesn't fall exactly on one of the pre-existing tie lines, you'll interpolate and find E1 and R1 at those locations. So that, once you've figured out where E1 is and R1, uh, firstly, why is that E1 and not R1 over here on the left? Okay. 
This is, this, this is the phase that's got a lot of solvent. E1, this is the solvent direction. That's the extract, so the other one is the raffinate. So once you've found these two points, in fact, you've got these six unknowns already. The R1 compositions and the, th the three E1 compositions. So that gets you those six unknowns, but those two locations, E1 and R1, don't tell you what the flow rates are. Okay? We don't know what those masses are, so how do we calculate that it's 2 to 1 kilograms for R1 and 129 for E1, well, that's the lever rule there. You have to use the lever rule this time um, for, for that. And, well, you, you don't necessarily have to, but it's certainly one of the easier ways to do it. So let's, let's apply the lever rule here, which says the mass of E1 over the mass of M. So you can pick any any two values. I'm going to pick E1 and M, but you could have picked M or R1 or E1 and R1, um, but the easiest one is just where you've got a single unknown mass of E1 that you wish to calculate. That's our unknown in the numerator. The, the denominator is known. And so that's the ratio of two lengths. Which ones are they in the numerator first? It's not, not tricky by now. The length of M R1. Okay. And the denominator length is, we've got mass M there, so this must be the mass from, the length, sorry, from E1 to R1. So that's the, the lever rule applied over there. So the ratio of those two lengths is easy to measure. Um, we can go to our diagram, and those lengths are, 45 millimeters over 122 millimeters. And the ratio of these mass E1 is what we don't know, but the mass of M we do know is 350 kilograms. Okay. And so then you can solve for E1 is approximately 129 kilograms. Okay. And then by difference, R1 is equal to 350 minus 129 which gets you the 2 to 1. Okay, so if we uh, just keep going with our mass balance then, and we just add that onto our diagram, let's take a look at our figure. We've got 250 of feed coming in, 100 of solvents, so that means my mixture here is 350. If this mixture comes to equilibrium, it splits out into an extract and a raffinate. We get 129 kilograms going to the extract, and we get 221 kilograms going to the raffinate. Okay, so the sum of those two add up to 350. So that's at steady state. We'll see those mass flows entering and those mass flows leaving for operating on a continuous basis. Okay. Let's take a look at what's actually happening to the species that we're most interested in, the solutes. Um, we're interested in, in that. In our feed coming in, we've got 0.24 mass fraction, 24% times 250 kilograms per hour. That's 60 kilograms per hour of A in the feed. Okay, so what happens to that 60 kilograms of A? That's really what we want to recover. We're hoping that most of it lands up in the extract. But let's see what actually happened. In our extract stream, I've got 129 kilograms per hour. The composition of that, though, YEA, is 0.33. Okay, so if you calculate that, it's about 37.9. So I'm going to just put it here as, as rough numbers. 38 kilograms per hour of A leaving in the extract. That's what we hoped for. We, we want to recover A. Maybe not quite so little. We were probably hoping to recover more of that. But we're essentially throwing away then in our raffinate the rest. Well, how much are we throwing away? Well, we can do it by difference, 60 minus 38. Or you can do it by a verification of the mass balance here. 
XRA is equal to 10%. Okay, so it's a low, it's a low fraction. 10% is definitely a lot lower than 33%, but the mass fraction doesn't tell you everything. It doesn't help that this stream flows at a lot higher rate than E1. So even though this is a lower mass fraction, it's still got a faster flow rate. And essentially what's leaving out here at the bottom is about 22 kilograms per hour of A. So 60 kilograms of A comes in. We recover 38 kilograms, but we're throwing 22 away in our raffinate. Okay. So we can calculate a number that quantifies that for us. The number is up here on an earlier slide, um, the slide regarding question four. So the number that we use is called recovery. It's how much solute do we recover? Okay. And you can sub into this equation one minus XRA times R over XFA times F. Well, that, those are the numbers we just calculated there, in fact. So 1 minus, in your numerator, 22 kilograms over 66 kilograms. And that's equal to about 63%. So you've recovered only 63% of A in the extract stream. So not, not a very good recovery at all. So what, what can we do about this? Right, we'd like to boost the recovery of A. Brandon? We can treat the raffinate again. Okay, so we can go send this raffinate to another stage. So the raffinate R1, in fact, becomes the feed to a, a second stage. Okay, so that's one option. Any other suggestions? What things in this diagram, just as here, are, in, are under your control that you can change? Sean? The type of solvent. You'd maybe change the type of solvent, and then that whole triangular curve would change to something different. Okay, so go evaluate another solvent. Um, what else can you change? You said amount of solvent, right? So you could go increase or decrease that number. Okay, you have the choice to vary the solvent flow. So what is your expectation if you increase the solvent flow? So instead of 100 kilograms an hour, you might choose to go to 150. So this is now really where this is going to test your insight a bit in this diagram. So let's go back here. There's your current triangular diagram. S now, instead of being 100 kilograms an hour, you're going to make it 150 kilograms an hour. How is that curve going to, how is that figure there going to update? I'll give you a minute, discuss with the person next to you. What's going to change on this graph if we use more solvent? Is it left or right? Yeah, the play around with it. Use the lever rule. You just read those off the diagram. So, so there is uh, Y, R, A is 10%, and there's 33%. Yeah. So once you locate those points, you get all six compositions. Right.
Okay, where is that point M going to move? If we add more solvent, M is going to shift. <clears throat> shift to the left, both. Shift to the right. Okay, so point M shifts to the left. We can see that here from the lever rule. Um, you can write out the lever rule for that line. Let's just look at the top half here. The mass of F is not changing. The okay, mass of F stays the same. If you increase the solvent flow rate, what happens is your mass of the mixture goes up. So this number in the denominator goes up. The length SF doesn't change. Sorry, the length SF, yeah, that's fixed, right? And then length SM must go down for that ratio to, to balance. So length SM goes down, it means this length must come shorter, so the mixture shifts. So now, Assume mixture M is over here, and it's going to, or let's just use this black tie line over here. So mixture M is over there, it's going to go along a new tie line. What's going to happen to your extract, and what's going to happen to your raffinate compositions? Your extract composition is lower, right? You're adding more solvent. This might seem counterintuitive. You're adding more solvents to your system, but your extract composition drops. You actually get lower YEA, okay? Because you've got more solvent. The ex, you, maybe you extract more, but it's now diluted in more solvent in the extract stream. And notice here that your raffinate R doesn't actually change a whole lot. It drops by a little bit. It says that Absolutely, you drop from, say, maybe 10% to 7%, but it's not such a big gain. Okay? So what I want you to get from this is that you can't tell ahead of time what's going to happen to your recovery. Right? You have to go actually do the calculations. I can't just look at this graph and make a good estimate of what's going to happen. So point M shifts, but it's going to dilute my extract and also dilute my raffinate. How much that affects the recovery by is something you have to calculate manually. So I'll, I'll encourage you, in fact, to do that yourself. Um, you've, got the, you've got the triangular diagram. There's spare copies up at the front. There's a PDF of it on the course website. So practice on it and, and try, try doing that. So I see now that you have to actually calculate and find out the mass of solute you have in your extract to see if it actually is better than that. You can't just tell from the composition. So to me, that implies that there would be some situations where it would get worse. Physically, why would it get worse? Just because you've diluted it. Okay, so, well, no, you never get worse. It, it's just what, what happens is your increase in recovery is not worth the extra money. Okay, yeah. so it might not. You never get worse. It will stay the same or just improve marginally. Yeah, so it can't go worse. Right, yeah. um, now, what I want you to look at then is this second suggestion that was made is if you take that raffinate, and essentially what we've concluded from this prior discussion is that adjusting the solvent flow might not be the best way to boost your recovery. But a guaranteed way to boost your recovery is to take this raffinate and put it through a second stage. Okay, so now I'm going to take that raffinate, which has now got this composition, 10% of A, at a flow rate of 221 kilograms an hour. So it's a different feed. Previously, my feed was 250 kilograms an hour with a composition of 24%. Now I'm taking similar flow, 221 kilograms an hour with 10%, and I'm going to contact it in a second mixer. The question is, how much solvent do you use in that second mixer? Do you use the same amount of solvent, 100 kilograms an hour? Do you use less? Does it matter? Okay, so let's take a look at this idea. I'm going to um, put it up there. I'd like you to consider this diagram and draw on that diagram what's going to happen when you add that raffinate, treat that raffinate as the feed this time and contact it with fresh solvents. So what's going, what are you going to add onto your diagram now? Okay, and then figure out where the mixture is and 
and do look at some alternatives for low, low, low solvent flow and high solvent flow. Mm -hmm. What happens with priorities? Always goes up, always goes down, or depends? Calculate it. Depends, right? You have to calculate it, yeah. yeah. So, so for, for, each, like, for each case? It's in most cases, it will go up. But it, it, like, it won't go from 63% to like 80%. Like it will go from, say, 63 to 67 Like it's a small boost of recovery. Yeah. But for example, you have to calculate every time. Yeah, you can't tell, like you can't look at the graph and say, yeah. I know that this is going to happen. But you have to actually... This is true, it's guaranteed to improve. Priority. Guaranteed and by, by a big amount. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, so what you should, should get from this question is that if you're going to send that raffinate as your feed, um, essentially you'll get a construction that looks like this. Ignore the purple lines. You get a construction that's of the green line. Okay? That raffinate becomes your feed. You're going to contact it with fresh solvent, and you're going to operate somewhere along this green curve. Now, where do you operate along the green curve is totally dependent on how much solvent you use. Right? So I've given you three cases here. You can just maybe add this onto your drawing and consider just two of them. Consider case B, which is lots of solvent, and case D, which is a low amount of solvent. And so at case B, you use lots of solvent, your recovery will be different than at case D, where your extract and your raffinate points are higher. Okay? So you get considered two, two of those purple lines, B or D. This is totally under your decision of how much solvent you add. And let's say you use a, a higher amount of solvent, you'll land up at point B, and then you can calculate the corresponding recovery, or you can choose to use a low amount of solvent, which means you'll be operating at point D and you'll get a different recovery there. I can't tell you just by looking at this diagram what those recoveries will be. Okay, we actually have to go do the calculations. Okay. And if this recovery that you get from two stages is not enough, you can then go add a third stage or a fourth stage. Essentially, what you're doing is every stage you're feeding your raffinate and it becomes the feed to the subsequent stage. So um, I'll post this PDF on, on the course website if you want to look at those details later on. But what I want you to take from this, and I'll come back to this exercise in a minute, is essentially you can build up a sequence of cross-flow um, cross banks. Each bank of mixer, each bank consists of a mixer and a settler. You settle your raffinate and your extract, and then you send the raffinate on to the subsequent stage. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm covering this in this course is because this topic of liquid-liquid extraction, while it seems like it's very specific and you may not end up using it, but this sort of arrangement of contacting material and then splitting it, contacting it again, splitting it, contact splitting, appears in so many other areas. It appears in ion exchange, it appears in leaching, it appears in flotation. So once you actually understand this principle and these equations, you can go apply this to any um, separator that's of this staged type system. Okay? So in this course, we'll only focus on the one type as, a, as an example, but remember that these tools and ideas apply pretty much to any stage-wise separator. Okay, so here's, here's your pre-homework for, um, for next time. Here's a new, a new system. Um, I'm going to hand this out. Feel free to, um, to take one or two copies. I think there's probably enough for two. Again, it's copied on both sides so you can make mistakes. And the numbers are in your notes. And try to repeat these calculations of finding the mixture location as well as the mixture composition as well as the equilibrium leaving in extract and raffinate.